Hello and welcome to Self-Sufficient Conversations. I'm your host, Natalie, and we will be talking with Steph from Indara Farms in this week's episode in our podcast series, where we explore what self-sufficiency means to others. Steph gardens on her rural farm in the wheat belt of Western Australia and only receives 400 mils of annual rainfall, yet she still has a beautiful and productive garden. Can you please chat with us and tell us what self-sufficiency looks like for you? Of course. Yeah. So self-sufficiency for me. Um, it's interesting. I don't think I ever thought I would be self-sufficient. Definitely not fully. Um, I like, uh, is it Mark from Self-Sufficient Me? He's on YouTube and he says, you know, you don't have to be self-sufficient in everything, just yeah. be self-sufficient in something. Yep. And I agree with that. Like, I think if you can be self-sufficient in you're growing on your own herbs or growing, you know, your tomatoes for the year or growing, you know, some meat birds or something that is a really good place to start. So yeah. I think that's what I'm aiming for to start off with is just really small, slow things where, you know, we've got chickens recently. So now I don't need to buy eggs. So we're now all of a sudden, you know, self-sufficient in our egg production. Nice. But um, yeah, I, I don't believe you can be completely self-sufficient without a good community around you. So yeah. Um, a bit like you doing that, you need to be able to barter, you need to have those friendships where, you know, they might be giving you, um, you know, something that you don't grow or and you might be giving them something that they don't grow or can't grow and vice versa. So, yeah, yeah I think um, that's what we're aiming for is just to start off being self-sufficient in a few things and then hopefully it will lead to being, you know, self-sufficient in a number of things over time. Yeah. But, Right now, we'll take the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And do you have that community around you? Because you're fairly new to where you are as well. I think you moved at a similar time that we Yeah. Did. Yeah. So we moved here three years ago, but we weren't far from here. Okay. So my community is technically still my community, um, nice. even though we're 30 kilometres away from our community. So we're in a little town called Meckering now okay. and we moved from Northam. So it's about mm -hmm. 30 kilometres away. So okay. I've got family in Northam and friends in Northam and all of that. We've met a lot of people around this community though. It is a different community, mm -hmm. um, but it's mainly farmers. So we're talking okay. big, um, you know, rural sheep and cereal cropping farmers okay. that are around this specific area. Okay. There's not much actually in the town of Meckering itself. There's a few houses and everything, but it's mm -hmm. just a very small rural town. So, okay, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and when did you start growing food? Was it when you moved or were you growing food um, in your other property? Yeah, I started growing food urban in our property in at Northam. Mm -hmm. So um, it was very small. Um, we just started with a very small little brick veggie patch out the back and I just started buying the odd seedling, putting it in the ground yes. and picking the odd tomato or cucumber. It was very basic. Yeah. And we planted some fruit trees, mm -hmm. which just started fruiting when we left. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, so we didn't get the benefit of those, <laughs> but we've left them for someone else to enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, um, so we did start. I did start then. I uh, had no idea what I was doing. It was just something that I literally just planted you know, no clue. Then I knew that I wanted to get more into that. I knew that I wanted to grow food. It took us three years to find the property that we're now in um, okay. here. So it took us a long time to just settle on something that suited us and what we wanted. Mm. And yeah, we then dived, dived into growing food. So we moved in to our property. I think it was May mm -hmm. uh, three years ago and then two weeks later I went and did a PDC oh wow nice and I had a five-month-old baby wow so it was very hectic yeah I just moved into the property and I was ready to get learning so yeah. <laughs> I jumped straight into a PDC did the PDC the permaculture design certificate then yep. came home and there was an existing sort of area here where someone at in the past must have been growing veggies there wasn't anything really set up except for it was a little fenced area mm -hmm. so I just started growing in that I just started planting things and learning and watching things grow and while I sat down and was doing a proper design for our property in the background so getting okay. a bit of hands-on experience and learning but knowing yeah. that that wasn't going to be the ultimate 
veggie patch that was just uh, a classroom basically nice and then from there it's progressed yeah <laughs> we were talking about so. this in the la- last week's episode we were talking about um i was interviewing jane who i did my pdc with and we we're talking about yeah. um the art of observation and how not everyone does that and i certainly mm. didn't do that when we moved mm. here because i was too excited yeah so did you take yep. the time to observe the land and um, definitely yeah. yeah that's awesome yeah yeah, because when I did my PDC, we were talking about the fact that I had just moved and basically the teachers there said, sit back for 12 months and don't mm. do anything. Yeah. Just observe and pay attention to what's going on in your landscape and mm. where the sun rises and where it sets and, you know, deciduous trees and the shade that that'll cast and the different shades over different times of the year. And, yeah, that and wind direction, which yeah. is important out here because it's very windy. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, um, that was actually going to be some advice I was going to give to someone is like, yeah, definitely sit back and observe. Mm -hmm. Um, You can still, like I said, I still jumped in just planting a few things because I knew that was just, it was very simple. It was very inexpensive. I wasn't Mm -hmm. investing much money or anything. And that gave me, because when I went and did my PDC, I didn't have any hands-on experience as such. Like I remember saying to the PDC teacher, I was like, so... I've grown a tomato plant before. Like I bought a seedling and I planted it. Do you think I'm going to be right with this course? And she was like, come on in. <laughs> you know, like, oh God, you know, what are we getting here? Yeah. I had no hands-on experience really. Um, so that, that, that space was still important for me to learn how a plant grew, you know, observe things, watch how pumpkins took over when I put them, you know, right where I entered and, <laughs> All those little things that you pick up from the moment you actually start growing yeah was important but observing and I really spent I ended up spending about two years on our design okay um 12, 12 months would have been ideal but what happened was we had a freak storm come through and actually destroyed our house basically and ripped oh, wow. our roof off wow so we had to leave our property last year so that threw a spanner in the works and we spent the whole year rebuilding the house Sorry. um <laughs> So I wasn't able to really start, you know, diving in. But it did mean that I had more time to research and plan and work on that design and really tweak it. So when I was ready, we knew where we were heading. We could hit the ground running and, you know, just dive in and go for it. Yeah. Can I ask you why permaculture? Because, you know, it sounds like you didn't have much growing experience. So it's really interesting to hear um, how you found out about it and why you chose that path I suppose yeah I think it was just a I was sitting at home with a five-month-old baby Mm -hmm. I saw a course pop up I wanted to learn how to grow food which is what it was sort of saying it was about Mm -hmm. and mum my mum had touched on permaculture back in you know the 80s sort of thing and had heard of it and I think she did a bit of things around it she never really became much of a grower as in growing her own food or anything but she had a fairly you know decent understanding of what permaculture was and she was like yeah you should go and do that course step it'll be great nice and um so that's like it was just a bit of a it just all lined up and I just sort of fell into it. It was a two week course. So it suited me because hubby could come home for those two weeks and I could just take a two week break. Nice. And, um, literally fell into it. (laughs) I remember driving home from the course each day, just going, Oh my God, my head hurts. My mind is blowing. (laughs) You know, like, I so much feeling. information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was uh, incredible. And especially coming from a background of like, you know, not even really basically understanding how plants grew or, you know, <laughs> what groups the plant families were in or anything. I was just coming home going, oh my God. <laughs> but it was really good. It was a really good foundation. I'm glad. I'm so glad that I started doing that because then I went yeah. on and did. I've done more study and everything since. Yeah. Then, so it's can really you, helped me. Um, can you go into what else you study? Because I think you're up to your diploma. No, I'm doing my cert four at the moment. Okay. So last year we did a certificate three. Yeah. So that was during my, you know, tragic year of losing the roof off the house. So I signed up to do the certificate three, which is all hands on. Yeah. And a lot of it is looking at your own garden and reporting and, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I lost the roof. I had no garden. I had no house. I had nothing. So we moved to our rental property in town, which was lucky because the tenant had like, 
just moved out. So it was a bit, it just all lined up Mm -hmm. and I started growing in pots and Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I would implement some worm farms and um, I grew a heap of tomato seedlings and seedlings, uh, you know, over that late winter, early spring break, knowing that I would be giving them away, but just to get that experience of growing and to write it all up for my course and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so that was the certificate three, very hands-on. That was one weekend a month where you attend and a lot of uh, study. Okay. And then uh, Cert 4 this year, I signed up in about April mm-hmm. last year and that is online. It's okay. an online delivered unit uh, course. And yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of research and study involved in that one. Okay. And then I was hoping to do my diploma this year, but because I'm still finishing off the Cert 4 and there is so much involved, I've just delayed that for another 12 months just to get more experience, finish this one off properly. And then hopefully I'll be able to do the diploma next year. Nice. Yeah. Are you hoping to go into <laughs> the design? <laughs> Are you hoping to go into design work or um, is it this just for your property? Yeah, I'm really not sure. Um, I'm just going to see where it leads yeah. and see what happens. I'm not sure about going in and giving advice and designs as yet because I still feel like, I'm really learning, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I might have the design skills, but I feel like you also need to back that up with the actual growing experience and stuff. Mm-hmm. So in the future, maybe being more of a learning place, like having people come here and showing yeah. them things and, you know, maybe the odd classes here, yeah, uh, not nice. so much me designing for people, if that makes yeah. sense. And yeah. hopefully even a bit of YouTube and things like that just awesome. to, yeah share my knowledge and because we are in a pretty brittle and uh, tough environment and lots of people ask me so how do you do this and how do you do that and it's like oh okay so there's there's a there's a want and a need to understand how I'm doing things yeah and I think yeah going practicing what I'm preaching before I start preaching you know yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) love it so would you recommend a PDC to someone who is just wanting to grow in their backyard? Do you think that a PDC is worth it? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it gave me the confidence to go away and start growing. Um, yeah. You know, just to understand the um, design process and really think about it and even just to refresh your mind on research skills, you know, because mm-hmm. you're not going to learn everything in a PDC. You're not going to walk out of there and go, wow, I'm full bottle now. I can yeah. grow everything. But they give you a foundation and they teach you how to go away and research and do, you know, element analysis on different things. And yeah. don't just stick something somewhere and think about how it's going to be connected to everything and yeah. what's it going to look like in the future when it does grow into this huge tree and shade out, you know, your veggie yeah. patch because you planted it in that spot. And So, yeah, no, I definitely would recommend if someone's looking at growing food organically and, hasn't got much experience to dive right in and go and do a permaculture design certificate. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, Nice. (laughs) Yeah. I really enjoyed mine. Um, I had gone into it with a lot of knowledge um, of permaculture and growing food. Um, But even though I felt I was fairly proficient in the garden, um, I still learned a whole, um, and I was able to go deeper into stuff that I may not have um, for a while. So for me, that was soil health. Um, microbes, um, hot compost, never yeah. really paid yep. attention to the difference between hot and cold compost. I always composted, but I never hot yep. composted. Yep. Um, but seeing the difference yep. that that's given my garden this year um, has been phenomenal. Yep. So, yeah, and a whole lot of yeah. stuff like um, broad acre, because I'm not proficient in broad acre, um, but things like yep. key line and getting a start in learning yep. about that, because that is quite um, yes. intricate. <laughs> um, Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what it does though, doesn't it? It opens different doors for different people depending on what level you're at. So yeah. whether you're coming in as a basic, basic, you know, very, you know, unskilled gardener yeah. to someone that has been growing for a while, mm. they still walk away and get something or they open a door. Like you said, uh, you're learning about key line now and it yeah. opens that door and you can go further into that. And mm. yeah, so I think there is, value no matter what level you think you're at if you haven't done it you're still going to get something out of it yeah Yeah. definitely yeah yeah um 
Can you talk to us about why you started growing food? So you had this small garden in your um, urban property and then you've expanded yep. that quite a lot now. Um, um, what was the motivation? Yeah, I think like I was saying, it's a lot of little things just slowly leading to that point. I think River Cottage Australia has a lot to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> You know, those series where you're like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, even Gourmet Farmer was amazing so, for us to even just yeah. show the kids of what we were going to um, be yep. moving into. What you're aiming for. Yeah. 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 So definitely those shows. But also I think there was a bit of concern, you know, around who was buying the farms up around our area. They're mm-hmm. being sold a lot to these investors yeah where our food's going to come from you know the food security questions yeah what chemicals are being sprayed on different foods and you know i'm eating those so what's going it what's going on and just a bit of distrust but you know so if i grow up myself and i know where it's come from i know what i've sprayed i know what the soil's like i'm going to put that in and then it almost becomes medicine doesn't it you're like yeah Mm. this is really good food you know so yeah, and health as well definitely was a big part. Just I'd had um, I'd had my first child by the time I decided to start growing, and my body had just changed completely. You yeah. know, I was feeling un, you know unwell. I think it drained a lot out of me, gained a mm-hmm. lot of weight, ate too much food, all the rest of it. Yeah, and then um, by the time the second one comes along, you know, I'm getting the back pain already. I'm not mm-hmm. that old, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking I really need to start changing the way I'm living and my habits. And to do that, I'm like an all or nothing person. So, you know, growing our food and hopefully our meat in the future will really, and just having the lifestyle of, you know, having the acreage, you just wander out, you can go for a walk, you can, you know, go exploring of an evening and it's just, it's, it's, you know, a little slice of paradise, your little place that you can. That's right. And I think a lot of what you said, sorry, yeah. you froze there. <laughs> um, I think a lot of what you said, you know, 2020 yeah. is a big eye-opener for so many people with um, food security yeah. um, and having bare shelves. So, you know, we saw yeah. seeds fly off the shelves. I couldn't get seeds. Saw so preserving equipment yep. fly off the shelves. You couldn't get pressure canners yes. and jars and stuff like yes. that um yep. canned goods but even things in the supermarket like um uh, washing soda so stuff that i use to make my mm. natural cleaners that people don't usually buy couldn't get buy uh, yeah um, so it was yeah. i don't know if it was that crazy so like, <laughs> over yeah WM. no it was and it's okay. like it's like all those skills that we've been trying to probably learn for a couple of years now yeah did everyone have them already and just you know, like because it's all very well buying a heap of seeds and don't get me wrong when I saw that seeds were selling out I went and bought seeds you know, yeah so it becomes that flow on effect yeah but I was like are they going to be able to it's having the knowledge to plant them and to mm. grow them then and all of that so yeah yeah it took me so 10 I years think 2020 is yeah it took me 10 years to learn yeah. how to grow from seed so prior to moving to the farm yeah. I was buying seedlings because Every time I tried to grow yeah. from seed, I failed. Um, but yeah. when we moved here, I realised that I couldn't keep buying seedlings because my space is too big and it was just going to cost too much. Too yeah. Um, so I had to really hone in on that, that skill. But that's a really difficult skill for little seeds. Tomatoes I found really difficult. Yeah. Chilies, capsicums, eggplants. Um, you know, the list goes yeah. on. But even brassicas I struggled with previously. Um, yeah. So it's not... Yeah, it's not an easy, easy one to just jump into. No, I know it's not. So, like, I'm glad that everyone went to that. And mm. I think there'll be a lot of gardeners coming out of 2020 going, yeah, I'm not going back. I like my little patch and I like, yeah. It, I think it just gives you that comfort, doesn't it? Even though it's not going to be supplying all your family's food. Yeah. It just gives you that comfort of like, oh, I can grow out and cut some herbs or get that tomato that I grew in. Mm. There's that whole new excitement for a whole new lot of people that may have been sitting on the fence going one day I want to, mm. but dived in, you know, had the time as well, you know, being obviously off work and in lockdown and at home. Yeah. like yeah let's do it let's get out in the garden and grow some food and yeah so but yeah food security is a big one and and just the ridiculousness of the transporting you know like mm. I remember we lived in Kununurra for a while which is up the top of western Australia yeah 
and there would be beautiful growers around there. They'd grow their mangoes, you know, corn, all these amazing things. And it would get shipped all the way back down to Perth, sorted in Perth, and then shipped all the way back up to like three and a half thousand kilometres one way, that is all the way back insane. up to be sold in the supermarket. And it's just, it's ridiculous. So, yeah, if you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, growing your own food, going to the back, back door and walking outside and picking something coming back in is a great start so yeah yeah that's um that blows my mind <laughs> i'm still trying yeah, to it is crazy it all the way down to perth. <laughs> all the way down to perth to get process sorted and then oh yeah we need to send some back up there to <laughs> be sold yeah. so yeah wow um are you so a lot of the growers the big growers yeah sorry no you keep going sorry you go okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, and a lot of the growers around there, I'm pretty sure they sign contracts. They can't sell direct to the public and stuff like that when you're part of, you know, selling to the big supermarket. So okay. it's not go. like the locals can just go and say, oh, I'll buy some mangoes off you. And like normally they've signed contracts to be selling it to the supermarket. So Okay, interesting. Can't, so. Mm, yeah. Are you surrounded by yeah. um, big um, cereal croppers around you? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, have you got a bit of gonna, land then? Yep. Yeah. So we're sitting on 110 acres here. Wow. So we're sort of right in the middle of big broad acre farmers who are sort of around the thousands, you know, a few thousand acres yep. um, each to more. Uh, yeah. So we're literally, we're on top of a hill in farmland. Um, you know, in the far distance, you can see a farmhouse. Um, across nice. the road and over the hill <laughs> that's about it <laughs> lovely and it's all yeah big um industrial cereal and sheep mainly croppers there are a few cows wandering around but yeah okay yeah mainly sheep out here we're surrounded by a few um agricultural farms much smaller because we're in dairy country and i suppose um you yes. don't need that crazy amount of space um, for production but no you've got the higher rainfall yeah 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 um, do, you, do does everyone think you're crazy for doing what you're doing because I feel like everyone thought we were crazy for moving out here like all the um, proper farmers kind of looked at us like yeah you want to be self-sufficient you want to grow everything yourself right okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's interesting um no one's really commented and said you're crazy uh, a few people were like, oh, you're living pretty remote, uh, especially a family that come up from the city. They think they're coming to the outback, you know, <laughs> <laughs> whereas we're just used to traveling. We're just used to, you know, spending 30 minutes in the car to get anywhere or, yeah. you know, taking that time. But the local farmers, no, I haven't, uh, they haven't said to me, oh, you're crazy for growing food. A lot of them <laughs> grow a bit themselves especially okay. the old school farmers mm -hmm. you know the pioneering sort of families yeah um, some of them do grow food and they have their own veggie patches yeah and it makes sense because we are so far from a supermarket to go yeah. and pop to buy some fresh you know herbs or something is ridiculous you're not going to do it yeah um there's no uber eats there's no takeaway <laughs> there's no you know there's no delivery of anything out here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so it makes sense and um i think there's been more curiosity than anything I think okay you know they're interested you know in what we're doing and how we're growing and you know why i'm doing certain things so yeah there's been no that. negativity with the local locals yeah i think just yeah. more curious and going oh hang on look what she's growing you know like we could give that a go or oh we're growing tomatoes already too and we're yeah. having problems with this you know pest or so yeah. yeah that's awesome but um i'm definitely probably doing it on a bigger scale like trying to do it on a bigger scale yeah uh, than a lot of people like they just have their you know smaller veggie patches out the back and rose bushes and herbs and stuff and yeah you know nice gardens but yeah we're probably trying to really get to that point where we're raising our own meat and everything as well so yeah and you already have sheep taking it a step further yeah we do have sheep now uh, we've got about 50. We've actually just put the ram in with his ladies uh, nice. yesterday. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be lambing, lambing our first year of lambing um, this year. So mm -hmm. we're just, we've bought some Afrino sheeps, the breed's called, and okay. it's a South African breed. And Is that just that tail one? And meat. Is that the one with the big no. tail? No. Okay. My husband used to live up nah. near you 
and um, his dad used oh, to okay. wool class all that kind of area. So oh yeah, yeah right oh wow. But there's this one breed that he um, keeps talking about. It's called like the Wazi. It's got like a really fat tail from um, Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that. Uh, oh okay. No, I'm not sure of that one. This one's South African. Um, and we just wanted something a bit different too. That was good for wool, good for meat. Yeah. And being from South Africa is supposed to be a lot more, you know, acclimatized to our climate. So we just thought, yeah, we'll go for something, you know, a bit unique, bit different. And we've gone with those and they're supposed to be really good, you know, with lambing and you don't need to mules them and all those sorts of things because it's the set. Yeah. It's been certain things have been bred out of them and stuff. So, yeah. But we're learning. <laughs> we yeah. did our first shearing this year and that was a lot of fun. So, yeah, nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're getting there slowly yeah. but surely. <laughs> Lambing is fun. We had, um, we did have some difficulties this winter, sorry, this spring, 2020 spring. Um, yeah. Because I think is what I'm putting it down to. We had a lot of rain last um, summer as well. And I feel like yeah. the rain washed something out of the soil. Um, and I think it's yeah. potassium that they lack when they um, have difficult births and they can't, um, they need yeah. help pulling out the babies. And, and so it was a huge learning curve. I think yeah. we had like six in a row, six or seven in a row that we had to pull, um, which wow. we had before other than a breech baby um, the year before that. Yeah. 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 I think it's calcium as well. So mm, okay. like our soils here are naturally lacking in um, calcium. Mm-hmm. So I've read different natural farming and stuff and they say you've got to put the, you know, the dolomite lime yep. on the soil to get that slowly back up. But you can give them, we're buying a, like a mineral mix, okay. which has got like calcium and um, a few other things that they do require. Yep. And you're supposed to give that to them from like, yeah. Ideally all year they should have access to it because they'll just go and eat it. Like it's, it's not a lick block, but it's like a mineral mix Okay. and they can just go and eat that when they crave it and when they need it. Yeah. But that's something that I want to design into my plan because it's, all, yeah, I want to working on the soil and getting mm. the soil right yeah. and having those minerals in the plants. And then they're just eating those plants and the diversity of plants. Yeah. They'll be able to access that themselves having certain fodder trees and shrubs and stuff planted as well in the future, they'll be yeah. able to go and help themselves. But right now, because we're just beginning and it's, you know, been left for a long time, mm. we're just giving that as a separate supplement. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I'll let you know how we go over lambing if that actually yeah. helps or, yeah, be <laughs> or if I have some issues too. Yeah. And <laughs> you can give them injections as well. Their yeah. vitamin uh, E and E and D and injections and stuff, which they recommend too. Okay. So, um, and what sort yeah. of soil do you have um, where you are? Is it sandy? No, um, it's a bit of a mixture. It, it, well, it's classed as a sandy loam. Okay. So it, it has got a little bit of clay in there. There is sand like, um, yeah, it's got like, We've got red dirt and white dirt over the property and we've got salty yeah. areas. So it's quite mm-hmm. diverse even within itself. Over summer, it's really, it goes rock hard, you know, yeah. so it's really hard to dig into. You wouldn't even bother trying to plant a tree right now because it's just yeah. so hard. But then over winter, it's beautiful. Like it just holds the moisture and the, mm-hmm. yeah, it doesn't repel any water. It's um, easy to dig into. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's really... It just changes throughout the seasons, I've noticed. Um, But again, we haven't done all our soil tests and everything yet on the farm, but that is something that in the future I want to do as well. Yeah. Get them all tested and sort of give us where we're at so we can have something to aim for in the future. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And um, what infrastructure did you put in to start growing your food? It's a beautiful patch. So, (laughs) yes. Yes, well, I've gone overboard. No one needs to do what I do. <laughs> no one needs to do what I did. But, um, yeah, so apart from the first one that we did when we were just growing in between, mm-hmm. we have recently put in brick garden beds mm-hmm. um, for a lot of my annual vegetables. Mm-hmm. We have also put in a chicken coop and four runs off the chicken coop. Um, 
that's oh and i've built an arbor as well which we need to paint and then have some grapevines growing over that as well so that's it at the moment as far as what we've built and done Mm -hmm. but we have um you know a long-term goal of yeah extending on that and lots more my big i did plant a big long windbreaker around my veggie patch too so i planted a lot of natives and and tagasastes and saltbush and all of those things nice uh some have survived some haven't so Mm -hmm. that'll need to be revisited in autumn again and really get that that's a really important thing for me in my vegetable garden is having that get established and get established well so yeah but yeah um we decided to go bricks to be honest because I think they look beautiful they do (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) and I'm a creative person and I needed a space that I walked out into and I was like yes I want to be here you know wow I'm happy this is lovely I knew that if I was walking outside and I was dealing with you know weeds and just a bare ground and I would probably struggle because I would give up and be like oh no I'm going back inside (laughs) you know like I wanted a space where I could be like yeah wooed I guess and just be like yep (laughs) this is beautiful and walk around and enjoy it so there's that main part of our vegetable garden which is brick beds yeah and then yeah going off from that it's not it's all different so you've got the chicken coop with the runs and then you've Mm -hmm. got yeah um, I've used rocks in other places and logs and yeah, nice. so there's lots of different um, things going on, but it's definitely, it's only this year that this has been built. So it's all brand yeah. new still, lots, lots still trying to get established. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, and the other infrastructure is we've put in a lot of trellises. <laughs> yeah. So we've used a lot of, um, I think Americans call them cattle panels, but they're actually sheep panels in Australia. <laughs> And we've used a lot of those so we can grow food up and have the yeah. tomatoes growing along and all Lovely. of that. So, yeah, that's the other infrastructure. Oh, and retic. Retic is coming <laughs> very Lovely. soon. Yeah, that's good, especially it's in all, your climate. It's all, <laughs> yes, we need to get the drip line systems happening. So, yeah, that's going to happen over the next few weeks, hopefully. So and how that'll do be you... a big game changer. How do you access your water? Because um, on 400 mils a year, I mean, that's absolutely nothing um, for me. Well, it's actually from less rainfall. than that. I think it was, <laughs> I know, I think it was 260 mils last year. <gasps> wow. And normally it's about three, normally it's about 330. So it's, <laughs> it's really low. Um, but we're lucky. Our farm is on scheme water or town water, okay. uh, which is really important out here. Yeah. But ultimately we want to be capturing more, you know, rainwater and we want to, I want to install a grey water system to water that windbreak that I'm talking about yeah. and things like that. So, yeah, um, it's all to come. And drip line will be a big, you know, big thing because the water mm. will be just going straight to the roots. You won't be wasting any, yeah. you know, by spraying and, you know, I'm just doing it via a hose right now. I'm just doing it all via hands, which takes a long time. <laughs> yeah to do but it does it <laughs> eventually me, we'll get to that yeah it could take me four hours a day to water um if i have to water the wow whole batch. um i don't hand water yeah. i use a sprinkler because i just don't have four hours yep. to water <laughs> four hours just to spare <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we're lucky that we've got the year-round creek that we can pump up from and that gravity feeds the sprinklers um we can't do drip Perfect. irrigation because it is dirty, like the water's dirty. And we'll just yeah. hog it up. But, yeah. um, I loved my drip irrigation back in suburbia. It was amazing. It was efficient yeah. and it did, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we might be able to go down and do a bore at some point as well, bore water, mm. and then we'll see what that brings. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's all to come. So we just haven't had the time or the money to do all that sort of research yet and yeah we definitely have enough roof space now to capture a lot more rainwater but it's just installing the tanks and everything now yeah Yeah. and the grey water system to me I'm trying to convince hubby you know (laughs) how important it is to do a grey water system I'm like every time we shower we could be watering my garden (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that's the ultimate goal um your chicken run is set up in, I think you said before, you got four pens and then is the goal yep. to then rotationally plant in each of those yep. pens? Yeah. 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 So 
I've actually got the plan here. I'll try and give a visual for the people that are actually watching. Nice. I'll see if this works. Oh, pretty. So the chicken run, so the run is in the center, like the coop is in the center. Mm -hmm. And then I've got four different runs coming off of the main coop. Yeah. And then um, I have four different little doors depending on which one I want to let them into. Yep. And the idea is that, yeah, each run, um, as they go through, they manure, they scratch, they weed, they fertilise it for me. Yep. And hopefully we'll build soil because yep. I'm going to start adding some layer of wood chips and mulch and stuff like that to the runs as well. Yeah. Um, then I'll go through and like I've done now and I've just direct sowed, um, like I've just literally put seeds in of corn and pumpkins and um, cucumbers and zucchinis, sunflowers, and then I'm growing in those runs while they're in a separate run. Mm -hmm. And then as I finish harvesting, they can just go in and enjoy the leftovers of the plants that were growing there nice. and do it all again. And hopefully over time, that'll just end up becoming quite a productive, you know, area with the yeah. soil. They're getting moved. So that reduces their, you know, disease and pest pressure. And yeah. And also they're helping me by fertilising the, the yeah. area. I'm actually, like, considering it's brand new this year as well, I'm so impressed with how the plants are doing in there. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, they all look healthy and, yeah, this is, you know, year one. So it'll be interesting. And I'm still trying to get a lot of the trees established because I have got yeah. trees planted inside the runs as well. Lovely. So at the moment I've got mesh around those, like just chicken wire to protect them because they're mm -hmm. only young. But eventually that will be taken away and the chickens will be able to eat some, you know, the fallen fruit and have the shade and lovely. Um, have some fodder of their own that they can, you know, get yeah. within the runs themselves. So yeah, at the moment it looks pretty bare still. Some of the back areas look pretty bare because the trees that I did plant in those didn't get any water because I couldn't mm -hmm. get to them. Yeah. And I think we had a few really hot days at the start of spring and a lot of things just went, oh, no, nah, we're out already. Yeah, well. <laughs> I was like, it's not even summer yet, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> <stuff it up. laughs> yeah. If you're checking out in spring, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Wow. We haven't really had any heat but, yeah. yet. I think the heat, the hottest we've had oh, is wow. not even 30, maybe, maybe low 30s oh, wow. once. Oh, wow. Uh, it's just been so cold. Wow. <laughs> We're getting oh, 34. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and we still haven't been able to cut hay, which um, yeah. usually we would have cut around about now, but we've had such good grass growth and it's dried off down in the hay paddock, but we just can't, A, get in there because it's too wet and slushy, but we can't cut way oh, that, no. uh, hay that's wet. So um, hopefully yes, this week no. we can cut it because I need that oh. for my garden. <laughs> And the animals. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no, well, we've had mid forties already. So wow. It's, it's, it gets hot. So yeah, yeah. that is hot. Um, <laughs> and quite a lot of 40 and 41, 42, 43 days. I think we've got another one coming up in the next few days. So yeah, wow. quite, quite warm in saying that it has fluctuated a lot. Um, we have dropped down to, you know, like high twenties and you're like, you know, are we summer? Are we not? You know, it's <laughs> been confusing for the garden and me. So, because yeah. I've noticed when we do get the warmth, the plants just, you know, as long as it's not those scorching days, they mm. actually really like it and they've grown really well. Yeah. And then it'll get cool all of a sudden and they sort of just, you know, Sulk. you know, they're not, yeah, so <laughs> they're not, yeah, not as happy. <laughs> so, yeah. my garden's so we'll see. It's been all over the place. Um, I'm still growing things that I'll usually grow in spring. So my yeah. cabbages are going crazy. Yeah, I've but noticed. that's not yeah. something that I usually They're grow not. in summer. Um, yes. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that I will get eggplants and capsicums and chilies and tomatoes because last year we missed out on tomatoes yeah. from bushfires and all the smoke haze. Yes. Um, and the cool yes. and the rain. Um, but yeah. we really need to stock up our pantry with some posada. Uh, yes other things like hot sauce <laughs> which is really yes. important for me <laughs> definitely <laughs> yes <laughs> I know uh, my, my tomatoes have been slow growing though too the ones that I um direct sowed okay so I just direct sowed a lot this year in yep. my garden beds I just put the seeds in started nice. watering yep and I was like yep whatever grows is going to grow and a lot did so 
it's awesome, but they're still starting to like, yeah, they're still in their growing stages. Uh, okay. The ones that volunteered over winter are producing. Okay. So they're all giving me tomatoes right now and they nice. just decided to grow over winter. So I let them. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, but yeah, so we'll see. And, but I'm having a massive problem with 28 birds at the moment. Just the parrots are just destroying my tomato plants. Wow. They just come in and shred the whole plant. Wow. So I'm, I'm going to have to come up with a solution next year. I'll probably have to grow them. I'm probably going to build a shade house on top of my large garden bed. Like yeah. I've got a big four meter by four meter one. Yeah. And then I'll put rows in that undercover because now that they know that they're here, they just, yeah, they bring back their friends and bring back more friends. And oh, no. before you know it, you've lost all your tomatoes. It's devastating. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, it is. Yeah. Um, we get um, flushes of birds. So it's like they fly through yeah. at the same time each year and they're like, oh, that thing that I came for isn't actually ready. Um, and so they'll keep yeah. going on. Or if they think something's finished, they'll keep going on. Like my broad beans, king parrots would come eat yeah. all my broad beans. Luckily, I planted oh, wow. a second crop and I got a harvest. Yeah. Um, but yeah. they haven't found my tomatoes yet, like the free summers have yeah. been here. But last year they took... 200 plus nashi pears off the tree um oh wow yeah so it's just it's gardening next to one the of forest. those things <laughs> yeah uh and look we're not even next to forests and it's still we've still got problems <laughs> that's yeah. probably the problem they don't have a forest to go and forage in they're foraging in my garden <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. i'll have to build on their own forest <laughs> stay away <laughs> um can you talk to us a little bit more about gardening with such little rainfall each year? Um, Cause I can't, like I said before, I can't even imagine such little um, rain um, in my know, garden. I'm, we, I'm very we, jealous. We get about 1400 <laughs> and this year will be much more because of La Nina. Um, wow. <laughs> and I still that sometimes, yeah. So I still, I still sometimes have to water um, in summer, but I yeah. don't think I'll need to this year for some reason <laughs> no uh <laughs> yes no I'm very jealous um yeah like I think growing in a low rainfall that's where permaculture is like helping me to come up with solutions so I'm starting to do a bit of chop and drop with the existing models that are on the property okay nice and using those as mulch mm -hmm. definitely mulch helps I you know all my garden beds are mulched with um, pea straw or whatever I can get a hold of okay uh, keeping the soil covered yeah um, I'm noticing is quite important and it does retain the moisture well when I do water though the soil does hold the moisture so mm -hmm. In the areas that I'm watering, like the garden, you know, the garden beds and stuff, I did dig down the other day and I was planting some seeds and even I was surprised. I was like, oh, this is actually quite, you know, moist under there considering we've had no rain and it's just been me hand, water, hand watering. Yeah. Um, cover crops in the future will definitely be something that we'll do. Okay. Um, just adding organic matter back to the soil. It's really just probably the same as you, just really looking after the soil. Yeah. And in other areas of the property, when I do start to design our food forests and everything, swales will be a big, you know, thing and okay. just trying to, you know, any, any, making use of any rain that we get, any rain that we get has to be, you know, stored yeah. in that area. So yeah. swales, mulch, um, yeah, installing grey water systems, all of that mm. sort of thing. But um, it's like that catch 22. I watch some gardeners who live in those humid climates and they mm. get a lot of rain and a lot of sunshine. They have their own issues with diseases yeah. and things like that. So it's that, you know, there's always something, isn't there? There is. Yeah. Ours is low rainfall, but yeah. you know, we get the nice sunshine and the plants don't seem to be real. I don't need to prune my tomato plants or anything like that. In fact, yeah. I did that one year on my mum's just practicing yeah because I'd grew mum a veggie patch last year when I couldn't grow my own yeah and I pruned all hers and I found it was the opposite in our climate it burnt the plant like the plant wow. just went oh I'm not happy so wow. yeah whereas so mine are overgrown and growing crazy and huge and that's a good thing because a the parrots can't destroy it all in one hit yeah 
and B, it sort of protects the plant because it's drying out. If there's no moisture in there, there's no, yeah. there's enough airflow. So just yeah. l- learning those key things that suit your climate yeah. that might not suit someone else's. Yeah, know? that's really so. awesome because at the moment we're seeing on Instagram, all the East Coast gardeners are all facing La Nina. Yep. And everyone's like, you know, yep. prune your tomato plants, make sure it's bare down the bottom. But you're saying that in your climate, yep. doing that's going to be actually detrimental. So... Yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, really well, that's what my observations, my yeah. observations are that that's, yeah, the opposite because the plant just, yeah, it doesn't need it. It needs the shade. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be protected a bit more. Yeah. So, yeah, just making those own observations, what's working in your garden. Because yeah. I love all the beautiful prune tomatoes. I yeah. think it looks amazing. <laughs> but, yeah, you, you do that here and they're going to burn to a crisp and die. <laughs> yeah, and you'll probably cook your so, fruit as well. If you're getting days in the 40s, yeah. you'll probably find that your fruit would... yeah right exactly exactly and i'm not they're not under shade cloth mine are just you know exposed to all the elements so if they were under shade it might be a bit different if they were protected um Mm -hmm. you might be able to prune and you know do it all nicely and train them and everything but i find i found yes through experience don't prune tomato plants in summer and my parents ones were actually under some shade cloth so even even more so so yeah yeah that's really interesting. I grew it for them, so it, I can destroy them if I <laughs> by, by accident. <laughs> Mum's yeah. like, told you not to prune the tomato plants. Sorry about that, Mum. <laughs> um, what would be your favourite thing to grow out there? My favourite thing so far are what the kids can snack on. Yeah, like nice. I love the fact that they can just walk out to the garden, pull up a carrot, eat a carrot, and that just, yeah melts my heart because I'm like that's what I want you know that's why I'm growing food as well so the kids learn and so that they can just have access to those fresh um you know veggies and fruit snow peas were a big hit over winter for the kids they loved going and picking all the snow peas yeah carrots my daughters just love eating carrots they'll just literally just eat a carrot (laughs) um nice watermelons and rock melons I'm trying for so I just noticed my first little baby water I think I've lost you, sorry. I, I can't wait for them. Um, yeah. Oh, did you? Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I was just saying, yeah, watermelons, watermelons and rock melons I'm excited for too. Yeah. I can't wait for those. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping I can grow them this what year. What else? Cold. <laughs> yeah, just anything that they can basically, cucumbers, like mm-hmm. the, strawberries, anything yeah. that the kids can just walk out. Yeah, the cucumbers. No, melons, sorry. I'm hoping mine. Oh, will melons! Grow. I'm yeah. getting cucumbers now, um, but the melon yeah. plants—they're starting to grow. Hopefully, they'll fruit for me. Yeah, I'm starting to lose you too. I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're getting. Yeah. No, that's okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, I've noticed the warm days. The melons just take off. Mm. Like they really do like that heat. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have um, patty melons up there? Are they an issue for you? Sorry, I've lost you again. Sorry. Um, (laughs) Do you guys have um, patty melons up where you are? Are they an issue? There is patty melons around. Um, We don't have a huge issue on our property, but yeah. all the neighbouring farms, I've, there's plenty. Yeah. Uh, but they, they're cropping those properties and spraying them and you yeah. know, having that bare soil. So they're obviously harder to get rid of. Yeah. Whereas our soil's only got sheep on it at the moment and we're trying to follow holistic management where we are trying to move our sheep and yeah. make sure that the ground isn't left bare and all of that. So touch wood, I've seen the odd one, but no, we don't have a huge issue with them do you on know if this they, property yet, but they are you, around. Do you know if they cross-pollinate with your other melons or are they different species? I'm not sure. I would imagine they probably could mm. um, if they were around, yeah, which would. But like I said, we haven't got any near our veggie patch or anything like that mm. around at this point. Yeah, yeah, it'd be something to look into. Yeah, the wild, yeah, the wild paddy melons crossing with yeah, those ones. I'm not sure. Yeah, 
you've got to be careful with so much stuff that can cross pollinate. The more you read, the more you're like, Oh <laughs> yeah. We've got wild mustard um, that grows along our roadsides. Um, I think because farmers use that as a biofumigant and as a, um, a soil builder. Um, and so I get that blowing in. Not only does it bring the white butterfly super early, but it can cross pollinate with um, seeds that I'm trying to save. Uh, That's yeah. yeah. It's just one of those things. Yeah, it is something to be aware of. Yeah. I know that the way we've got another weed. I'm just trying to think. I think it might be Cape Tulip. Okay. I'm not sure. And I read somewhere, I think it's part of the brassica family anyway, because mm-hmm. when I was saving seeds of my brassicas, I noticed that those seeds and the way that, that plant was growing mm-hmm. was the same. Like it's yeah. very similar with their seeds. So going forward, I'll have to be aware that if they're growing, because that'll be winter time when we do have lots of weeds. Mm-hmm. Um, that they might cross with my um, brassica plants. So yeah. I've just, like you, bought that Seed Savers handbook and yeah. I've got to sit down and I really want to dive into that and really start learning because I really want to try and save as much of my seeds as possible yeah. and do it properly. Yeah. Know. yeah. It's really interesting once you learn more about seed saving um, and, you know, I can grow a couple of different brassicas at once and still save the seeds with them not crossing. Same with pumpkins, um, yep. which, yeah, I'm really excited about. So I bought, um, this year I bought well, for 2021 summer, so next summer, um, Black Beauty Zucchini. No, maybe I think I chose Lebanese Zucchini. Uh, I've got Queensland Blue, Butternut Pumpkin, and then a different pumpkin. It's kind of like a crookneck. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and, but they're all different yeah. species in the Kirkabitta family. So I've got um, Kirkabitta yeah. Pepo, um, Mixta Moshgato, and then Mixta. I think they were all the different ones. So I can save seeds without yeah. them crossing. And because I yes. live so far from everyone, that it doesn't matter that yes. my neighbours aren't going to cross pollinate yes. with mine. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah, and corn's the other big one that crosses really easily, apparently. Yeah, yeah it does. So you if- your different corns and that. So I've got a few different corns growing right now that yeah. are not a hundred meters away from each other. So yeah. It'd be interesting to see if they end up crossing or what ends up happening with them. Yeah. I was hoping that they would all sort of like, you know, tassel at different times, but they've all yeah. decided to do it together. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Do you have neighbors um, that grow corn commercially or is it not your, no, not the right no, area? Not, for out, that? not out here. Yeah. No, not, I would say not enough rainfall for that. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's mainly just your cereal crops yeah. over that winter period. Yeah, okay. So there's nothing growing right now over the summer period. No crops around us at the moment. So Okay. And so it's a sheep running on that land? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, that... if the farmers have sheep, then they'll have sheep on their land. If not, they just leave it. Okay. So does that mean they don't cut straw or do they cut um, the cereal crop then straw? Depends, yeah. Some of them would cut um straw some of them would um some of them burn it because i was actually chatting to my husband the other day because the farmer across the way has got all this amazing looking straw that they've cut and i'm like oh i wonder if they want to give his <laughs> garden bed it's so good. and he was like the reason they <laughs> the reason they do that is because it's got all the weed seeds in it and it's got all the seeds uh, of that crop so they'll go through and probably burn those paths wow um but yeah but yeah but right now i you know, they'll just move through sheep through the different um, paddocks if they've got sheep. Some farmers, like, um, don't have sheep either. So yeah. it's just another thing to take care of. So it just depends yeah. on what their programs are. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fair enough. Um, and then I think lastly I was going to ask is the biggest piece of, of advice for those wanting to start out um, growing food. Yeah, I think we touched on the first one that I was going to say, which was yeah. observe. Yeah. Um, before doing anything really pay attention to what is happening on your property uh it doesn't matter if you're urban rural whatever you know notice where the sun rises notice where it sets notice the shade notice the wind directions what's the existing vegetation like what Mm -hmm. weeds have you got you know what's that telling you about the soil um the next thing would be uh try and keep records so when you do plant things just even if it's just a note of the date you planted it and what variety it was and where mm-hmm. you got it from. 
especially if you're going to go into seed saving, then you can look back and go, oh, that's right, I planted, you know, Queensland Blue Mm -hmm. and I got those from, you know, wherever and they did really well and, you know, you can keep records of just really basic records or you can draw up a plan and write on your plan where you planted certain things. I'm finding, especially as a new gardener who you might not recognise every single thing that's growing yet, Mm -hmm it's really helpful to look back and go, oh, that's right, I planted sunflowers there or, you know, I planted beans there or whatever. Yeah. The other piece of advice I would give is to dream big, you know, plan big. Do your plan as if, you know, as if you could achieve it in your wildest dreams, you know, like really write everything down that you would love and plan for that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to start with that, but it means that, as you slowly work through the years, Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to be like, oh, I should have put that there and now I want a shade house and I should have done this and or now I want animals, you know, and Mm -hmm. I I put that there and now I have to move it. It saves you a lot of time and effort with moving things and uh, money that you spent on infrastructure. If you really plan your dream garden, you know, Mm -hmm. your dream property and then slowly but surely bit by bit, you can start off implementing different things. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, yeah, and I think it's okay to give yourself permission to create something beautiful. You yeah. know, if you want that and that's going to get you out in the garden and that's going to, yeah. because it's going to be work, it's going to be a lot of work and, mm. you know, you're going to have days where you're like, oh, why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> it seems like a lot of effort you know, to get this tomato or whatever. Yeah then you want somewhere that you actually enjoy being, that you want to go outside and be like, yes, you know, I love this place, even if, you know, it's not producing right now or it looks a bit dreary because we've just had 45 degree, you know, heat day. Yeah. You're still going to get up and go out there. So I I think it's okay to have, yeah, have permission to dream and create something beautiful, create a space that you will love. Yeah. Yeah. For so long, I wasn't growing flowers in my veggie patch because I thought flowers were a waste of time (laughs) when I could be growing food. Um, And it was only when I started following people on Instagram and I saw these beautiful spaces that I had created, they had incorporated both. And I was like, you know, I've got the space now and I've got the time. I've got the skills. So why not give it a go? And it's just changed so much. It's changed the enjoyability of being out there. Even though I love pottering in the vegetable, yeah. it's just yes. pretty and, you know, seeing the new flowers each yeah. day and the different colours and, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's important, yeah. Mm. And um, I'm the same. I've straight away, like, I've been wooed by people's gardens on YouTube and Instagram as well and I'm like, yeah. I knew I was going to interplant and I was going to have the odd flowers growing yeah. and in my veggie gardens yeah and that was going to be just what I was going to do so yeah no (laughs) and I love it I love the sunflowers and we're Mm. just starting to get some zinnias and lovely um yeah it's just so pretty when you're out there and you're watering and you're like oh that's really pretty and that's different and you know Mm. then I think that's okay too and it brings in all the pollinators and your beneficial insects anyway so yeah it's all about creating that biodiversity and yeah it's all going to benefit your annual vegetables anyway so yeah Yeah, I agree I agree (laughs) is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap this up i could just talk all day about (laughs) permaculture and (laughs) so yeah Yeah. i could just keep on going but yeah (laughs) no um i think find people that inspire you follow Mm. them and it's okay to be inspired and yeah yeah, it's good to have that inspiration actually because even me, I watch a few people. Sorry, someone's kind of cool. I watch a few people on you know YouTube and like yourself and you know just places that you find inspiration. Yeah. Uh, because you're gonna have days where you're gonna be like, oh, why am I doing this? And you know, yep. it's pretty hard work. And yeah. Um, and you'll see something and it will pop up. You're like, oh, yes, that's right. You know, and it just yep. re-inspires you. And yeah. Yeah. So, but just give it a go as well. It's really not that hard. Um, mm. And you will have failures. Like I yeah. go in expecting that you're going to kill plants. Yeah. <laughs> Things are not going to work. Yeah. You're going to have 
days is I just killed a lemon tree because I shaded it out over winter by letting everything else grow around it and it was okay. too young to reach for the light. So yeah. by the time spring came and I removed everything and found it, I was like, oh, <laughs> whoops. <Oops. laughs> yeah, we all so, things. I you learn from your mistakes. Yep. <laughs> I, um, and that's okay. Yeah, my biggest failure, <laughs> and it happens every year, is pulling all my seedlings out of my hothouse where I can just water, turn on yep. the tap, water it um, with misters, yep. bring it down to the veggie patch, have all good intentions to plant them all out. But of course I brought too many down at once yes. and then I leave them there and they die. Yes. A lot. <laughs> yep. I've done that a few times myself. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But you can just read those little seedling trays. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's right. And just give it a go if it's something that you want to do. I, yeah. And also do a course or research, research the hell out of things. You can find so yeah. much information in books and online and um, through Instagram and through asking people. And yeah. just, yeah, if you have questions, ask, If you, research, you know, look up what a plant needs. Even if you just start off with a one plant that you really want to grow and go, right, yeah. I really want to grow this, you know research the hell out of that plant so that when you go to plant when you go to grow it you'll have a fair idea of what you're doing and you'll have more confidence to give it a go too yeah 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 it's really good advice <laughs> awesome thank you so much for joining awesome. me today here steph um, okay. i'm gonna leave all your links down below so your instagram account where people can follow yes. along and keep up to date with um things that you do in the future like that in your courses and hopefully your youtube channel too um and continue hopefully to just building up the courage <laughs> yes you can do it yeah <laughs> inspire people in these um semi-arid areas i would say you're even closer to arid than semi-arid um by some of those numbers that you were saying before um that's really really challenging um it's an extra mm. challenge than you have for just gardening in a in the east coast for example or down below yeah. um bottom of WA where you get a bit more rainfall than that. Yeah. Um, so I think yep. that if you really encourage people that don't have the rainfall but still want to grow. <laughs> yeah, it's still possible. Yeah. Awesome. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. We've chosen this place, so I've got to make it work now. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> well, it looks like it's working out really well. Well, for thank you. you. <laughs> it is. It is. It's good. It's really good. <laughs> I'm trying to call again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's all good. I'll talk to you soon. Um, and thank you so much again. Awesome. Thanks, Nat. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks so much for interviewing me. Bye. Bye. <laughs>